cool. So today on the podcast, we have Mike Hankstebeck. You have an uh, extensive knowledge and, and experience in firearms, military, and most recently the cannabis business. Um, so how did you get started in all this? Um, it's uh, been really an interesting journey with this whole thing. It initially started with uh, a friend of mine who was a uh, special operations out of McDill Air Force Base mm-hmm. and uh, suffering from PTSD. And he had 24 years of honorable service to the country and uh, ended up having some problems. Uh, got physical with his wife one night, was arrested for domestic violence. Um, we tried to get a grip as to what was going on. Again, this guy's a uh, special operations guy. They don't touch their wives. They're not abusive individuals. Right. And uh, so we started to figure out that he was on 14 different type of psychotropic drugs that the VA was giving him. And his, Psy- what is psychotropic drugs? These are drugs that actually help them with deal with PTSD with regards to actually altering their moods. Okay. So the biggest problem is obviously sleep with a lot of these guys. They're just not getting good sleep. Right. And if you're a special operations guy, you're used to being the guy that goes and helps everybody. You're not used to asking for help. Right. A lot of these guys just don't go down that road. And um, after this became apparent there was something wrong, I said, uh, Alan, what is going on? He said, listen, man, the last, the last uh, medicines that the VA sent me, you know what it said? It said, may, have, or may create anal leakage. He's anal on, leakage. Anal leakage. And he's, I'm 44 years old, and I've got to shit my pants because... What the fuck? So it became a real issue. So we started to look at the, what was really going on with him. And at the mm-hmm. same time, I saw a program on TV called Viceland. Yeah, yeah. And they were, uh, it was a dealing with a security group in the cannabis business uh, out in Denver, Colorado. And these were all combat vets. So you know, our combat vets are suffering from PTSD in the worst way. We're losing 22, 22 guys a day, 22 uh, honorably charged, discharged uh, well-meaning human beings that are coming out into the world and committing suicide after they come out of the military. Every day. Every day. So when you start to look at, the, at these numbers, this, that is not acceptable, um, we decided that we were going to send Alan out to Denver, Colorado to actually meet with, I actually called the CEO of the company up and spoke to him on the phone, kind of told him what our dilemma was. Uh, the, yeah. the, the answer wasn't to go out and medicate or to start smoking cannabis. The, the message was to get out here and talk to other brothers who have been in combat who understand what you're going through and can identify what's happening. So right. after about four or five days of trying to convince him to go out, he decided to go out. We put him on a plane, flew him out there. And um, he was out there for about two weeks. And again, all the individuals they hire out there are combat vets. Mm-hmm. So he had decided after about a two-week period that um, he was going to try to medicate. Uh, this is an individual who'd been on five different operations looking for Osama bin Laden in the Middle East and was very um, full of bravado the nights that he would go on these operations saying, hey, tonight's the night we're going to kill this guy. Right. The night that he was getting ready to to medicate the first time, he was absolutely terrified. And I had to remind him that, listen, marijuana never killed anybody. Nobody overdoses on marijuana. You can. It's impossible. I said, we didn't send you out there. This is not about trying cannabis or marijuana. This is about going out there and kind of find a center spot that you're in a better place. Mm -hmm. So after about 45 minutes of talking... He decided that uh, he was going to medicate that night. They were all they were camping outdoors, and uh, he called me at eight o'clock the next morning. And with uh, the uh, the realization that was the first time in six years he had slept through the night. Wow! So we uh, we started to identify problems. Really, with sleeping. I mean, listen, when you catch prisoners of war, um, the first thing you want to do is deprive them of sleep. Three days of no sleep will kill you. Right. So you can imagine if you're not sleeping well through the night, having these challenges, these problems. So we kind of began to identify what was going on with Alan. Now he is, you know, he remarried his wife. He's living out there again. He's fully functional. Wow. Um, I'm a full blown on advocate now for cannabis and the vet, the whole vet side of it. Right. To understand that these guys are, like I say, we're losing 22 a day. Unacceptable. Um, it's changed his life around completely. Uh, it's impossible to overdose on cannabis. You can't do it. Mm-hmm. There's been no uh, lung infections, cancers. I've looked, I've spoke to medical professionals now here in the state of Florida for the last five years as we look at the legalization of cannabis here in Florida. Right. Obviously, because it's still federally illegal as a Schedule One drug, um, the VA is very, very slow to react to this whole process. So, again, the whole hard car uh, background, the understanding of what we're trying to do is trying to bring this to the forefront. We hire nothing but combat vets. We're a uh, world-class asset protection and transportation group. We drive up armored vehicles. Um, they're very discreet. Um, we look for combat vets because, obviously, this is the kind of experiences they were having overseas. So we have a purpose. We have a function. There is somewhat of danger involved um, with regards to what we actually do, but it's scheduled. Um, so by bringing other vets into the picture, 
uh, these guys now have their camaraderie and there's the bravado and all the yeah. things they were missing in the service. So what what has been uh, what has been like the latest research or, or where is this country at in regards to treating PTSD? Like what has been like the most, the most recent science on it or studies on it? Um, I think, listen, when we start looking at really at what's going on with PTSD and you start looking at combat vets, especially, Mm -hmm. um, the challenges are this, you're overseas, you're in an environment where you're getting mortared every day or shot at or with the possibilities you've got, um, vehicle borne IEDs that are going off. Um, every day is a, a day that's full of adventure. And when you live at such a high plateau where you're literally, you know, listen, you hear a boom go off in the background and your adrenaline starts to run, you know, instantly that something, something's going on somewhere in town. So this goes on every single day. So if you do this for about 12 month period, what happens is you become used to kind of living at that higher level. So when you come home, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I think we could talk about this. One of the guys we have is a former scout sniper. Great guy. To look at the guy, you'd never realize that this guy suffers from PTSD in such a, a bad way. Scout sniper. What do you mean by that? He, uh, he's actually a sniper in the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, been in for eight years. Uh, wow. Saw five combat tours. I'm not going to get into the number of individual kills these guys have. Um, now, let me just say this too for the record. Um, we vet every, every vet that comes to work with us. We vet them out. We make sure they're exactly who they say they are. We look at their DD-214s. We're verifying who these guys are. Again, you, you must be a combat vet if you want to work for hard car. So as we start looking at these individuals and start peeling back the layers, um, I saw he was a scout sniper. I knew he had deployed to Iraq. Didn't realize how many times he'd actually deployed to Iraq. And then we started talking about the number of kills that he had actually accomplished while he was there, which was extraordinary. And I'm thinking to myself, what do you do with a guy like this when he comes back? What do you do with a Navy SEAL who's got five or six tours under his belt? He's been trained. He's had millions of dollars uh, instilled upon him or her to be this special operations person. Um, why not bring them back here and give them a chance to use all, so all that knowledge base they've learned? There's millions and millions of dollars that they pull, pulled up on. Right. So for us, it's been a big push in that whole direction to make sure we're, we're getting these guys kind of back, to, again, to a... Uh, listen, it's not real dangerous, but obviously there's, there's dangers involved. There's robberies and theft that go on all the time in California. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're constantly training. We're constantly bringing the guys up to speed. We also want guys that are, um, that are used to handling weapons. Uh, I don't think I've talked to anybody who doesn't want to do this job. The problem is finding the right combination of um, guys that we want. Again, listen, we're talking about the cannabis business. Right. Most people are friendly and nice. They don't want to be met with a knuckle dragger who's, you know, got a gun slung around his neck and uh, talking about, hey, well, the next time we see this guy, we're going to kill him. They don't want to hear that. So you need that, you need that uh, kind of that in between where the guy's happy and go lucky, but understands, hey, if things not go left. Not just pissed left, off about everything, right? Absolutely. And if things go left, we're not looking for a gunfight. Right. We'd like to be able to de-escalate anything we run into. If I can get in the car and drive away, again, all of our vehicles are up armored. Uh, we have that ability to drive away from a situation providing that everybody's in the truck and we can just pull away. So we look at de-escalation as, as a big part of what we do across the board as well. Um, wow. So it's, it's been a, uh, an ongoing procedure here in Florida because the, the laws have been slow to change. Um, now they just finally, the legislation just passed where we can now have up to two ounces of cannabis in your possession and actually be able to smoke the flower now, which for patients is going to be huge in the state of Florida. Where And where is this? This is here in the state of Florida. That's in, just in for Florida. patients, though, right? Correct. It's just for just for patients right now. Right. Okay. Um, we're probably looking at the recreational aspect of it coming up soon. A couple of different things could happen. The president could go ahead and wave his magic wand mm -hmm. um, for re-election purposes and go ahead and legalize it. The governor nationwide, do, nationwide, right? Nationwide. Yeah, that would we, help him get elected again. <laughs> absolutely. Well, we have. Four, yeah. It's ridiculous. We have fourteen states right now that have it legalized in some way, recreational or medical. Right. Um, when you look at some of the dynamics and you start doing the math, um, I initially get getting into this wanted a bigger bigger picture of the economics that are involved. So I go to one of the first areas that ever started being sold recreationally, which was Denver, Colorado. Right. And it was amazing when you look at this this uh, Denver small city, kind of a microcosm of five million people. Um, their tourism was around twenty seven thousand people a year on average. Um, after cannabis became legal, that went to 77,000. The To date, um, now I went out there and I spoke to Chief Brown with your Aurora Police Department. The Aurora Police Department is the largest police department in Denver. So I went there and actually spoke to him and asked him about, hey, is there anything positive that's coming out of this? Mm -hmm. And he refused to really wave the flag on the positive side. He said, listen, the people here have voted on this. 
I'm here to support what the people wanted. But I will tell you this. We have 28 new cars, patrol cars, that we didn't have before. We have three new high schools that are going up now. The teachers have gotten the pay they deserve. Um, the economy, just in this one microcosm, from 2014 to current, it is about $1.5 billion just to that area alone. So when you start to look at the infrastructure and what's really taking place, it's, it's a dynamic. It's, it's a change in entrepreneurship. It's a change in the way we look at certain uh, ways to relax and enjoy ourselves. Um, when I looked at the bigger picture, um, they had, they had uh, obviously it was uh, 420 was coming up. And the chief said, well, if you're staying here for 420, I suggest you go out. He put me out with one of his sergeants, and I met him the next day. This is in Denver? This is in Denver. Okay. And the funny part was that when I got there to help him kind of unload, uh, he said, hey, do me a favor. Grab that big box of Doritos right there. And I just kind of <laughs> laughed. I said, you're kidding, right? He's like, no, dude, really. Who doesn't want to smoke a joint and eat a bag of Doritos? True. And I said, Sarge, we need to have a talk. I really need to understand where you're coming from. He said, this has really been good for the economy here, man. He goes, if you, what you're going to see this afternoon is they'll have a big smoke out here. And he goes, if you look around, there's probably about uh, almost 100 new restaurants that have popped up in the area now that we're not here anymore. So what do those restaurants mean to the city? It's more tax income for us. It's more revenue. We generate it more. Um, listen, he said, well-fed people are happy people. And I said, now let me ask you this, with this event going on out here today, um, what is what is the arrest record? I mean, he goes, well, listen, typically if this was a political event, he said, we'd have 5,000 people out here. It'd be crazy. I'd have to have all my officers out here. People Plus, getting violent, right? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody wants to, everybody has a stand. Right. And so he said, I'd have to have the sheriff's department out here. We'd have to have a paddy wagon set up. I've got to make sure there's room at the jail. So I said, so you're probably talking, you know, 100 plus officers, deputies. He said, oh, absolutely. So look at all the overtime that's incurred. Look at all the time, the space that's taken up in jail. All of these different things that are defined by what we do. And I said, so let me ask you this. With this taking place today, uh, how many will, arrests will you go on? He goes, listen, other than the drunks, <laughs> there'll be no arrests today. Wow. So again, these were all eye-opening uh, experiences for me, looking at the bigger picture not really ever thinking it from a medical perspective, but truly seeing now the benefits. Um, talking to law enforcement who have a much uh, greater detail of understanding the THC. And when I talk to these law enforcement officers across the board, the funny part is they always start out by saying, hey, look, no one smokes a joint and attacks my deputies or attacks an officer or, or beats his wife up. Right. So it's, uh, it's, from an educational perspective, it's been really, really interesting to say the least. Why do you think Florida is so far behind? I mean, I mean, how many states? There's seven states, is that right, right now that are legal uh, for recreational? Correct. So why, I mean, when do you think this will happen with Florida? Why is Florida so far behind? Florida has listened. Florida really has, has had a couple of different challenges. Um, the first challenge being the governor, right. uh, Governor Rick Scott, mm -hmm. the initial understanding that uh, there's another gentleman named Mel Simbler. Mel Simbler's a billionaire. Uh, he lives right here in Pinellas County. Really? Um, he is actually the one that supported Rick for both his first run as governor and the second run. Okay, yeah, I know who he is oh, now. Yeah. Real estate guy. Bingo. Yeah. He's also a big Narcam guy. He used to own uh, and have a business back in the, the 80s called Straight. It was a drug intervention program. He has now uh, another one I can't, I don't want to promote his website, but it's a, it's a, it's a like drugfreeamerica.com. And it's so all, he's really against it. So he's big time against and it. And he but, was a big supporter of Rick Scott. Absolutely. And also a big, big report, uh, uh, supporter of Narcam and some of the other drugs that are for really? Narcam is obviously, you guys know that if you take an overdose of heroin. Right, they shoot you with it, bring you back bring to life. Bring you back to life. Right. So obviously it be, behooves him to have cannabis not legal so that people will continue this madness with the fentanyl and all the other drugs out here that are killing people left and right. It got so ridiculous. In, Jesus Christ. That's ridiculous, man. If you look at um, Manatee County here in Florida, uh, last year, I think it is, and I may be off on, on my year, but um, they were typically having about one to four overdoses a month. It went to one to four overdoses a day, and they had to open up a second morgue. Where is this? This is in Manatee County, just south of uh, where we're located at here. And what was the overdoses? What were they overdosing on? Uh, most of it was fentanyl. Okay. The heroin would be so pure. They would actually do it in like, you know, the, with their kids in the back in the gas station. And then yeah. somebody would take a picture of them all passed out in the truck, hanging out all over the place. So it behooved him. And when I say him, Mel Simbler, to right. not have cannabis legal in the state of Florida. So what happened then, I'm sure, I'm sure this is the business deal between those guys kind of went like, Hey, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you and make sure you get, you know, you have all the money you need to get voted in to be the next Senator. And so that, he put a, a, a gentleman in place by the name of Christian Bach, who ran the Department of Health. 
the Department of Health, which is kind of odd, are the group that actually handle the cannabis here in Florida when it should be the Department of Agriculture. And But he did that again to set it up purposely so that they would run interference on the legalization of it. Uh, so that what they did was they put um, different processes in place to slow it down. In other words, you couldn't smoke flour. It had to be into a, an oil type, right? Um, <clears throat> like a vaping pen of some sort. Right. Um, they made sure that um, there was no edibles. Uh, you had to process it. You had to do what's called vertical integration. You had to do everything right there at the grow, from grow it to process it. You had to provide your own security, your own transportation. And at the end of the day, these nurseries that were selected were selected because of their ability to produce a quality plant, not to do security work, not to do processing. So this slowed everything down because now the nursery's got to learn how to process. Mm -hmm. They have to understand transportation. Mm -hmm. They need to understand there's an expense involved with that. So as the, the kind of the, um, the program went along, it just kind of got slower and slower because guys didn't know how to process. Now they got to know to do that. Now, with uh, Governor DeSantis in place, who understands the will of the people here in Florida, again, let's not forget 72% of the people here in vo Florida voted for medical cannabis, um, that the will of the people was to be able to smoke flour. Uh, so they'll now be able to have up to two ounces of cannabis in their possession. This will still have to be finalized and through through the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, but they'll be able to have two two ounces of cannabis in their possession. And I listen, don't travel with it in your car. <laughs> Let's not smoke it in the car. <laughs> you will get caught, and it's a bad day. Um, right now, law enforcement's kind of taking a different look at this. Yeah. Um, again, we have to understand this is about generating revenue. The sheriff's departments are a business. They have to be run like a business. Right. Um, the majority of law enforcement officials, from the chiefs to the actual sheriffs that I've spoken to, um, all believe that it should be recreational available. The problem is that it, it generates money for them. For every, and the way it was put to me was that, hey, Mike, most marijuana smokers are easy targets. Um, I get reimbursed from the federal government for everybody I arrest. So really what you're asking me to do is give up part of my budget, which have, oh, by the way, here in Florida, taken a beating since 2008. So now you're just asking me to give up more of that money. It's not, it's, listen, it's a victimless crime. You know, people don't smoke pot and attack my deputies. You can talk to our narcotics guys. I'll talk to all the guys across the board. They all realize where we're going with this and what should happen. I tell you, if you, if you put somebody in prison who has smoked cannabis, they don't come out a better person at the end of the day. And most of these people are, listen, if you got caught smoking a joint down at the beach, um, and what people don't realize right now is because if you do this the right way, first of all, you shouldn't be smoking at the beach. You won't have any problems then. But if yeah. you are and a law enforcement officer walks up on you, do not stick that joint in your mouth. Don't flick the joint into the water because now you just committed a felony where before he's probably just going to write you a ticket. But if you caught destroying evidence, now you're going to go to jail. Really? Now, yeah. So it takes on a whole new life. So there has to be some smarts used. I, mean, mm -hmm. I would definitely encourage you, listen, don't smoke at the beach, don't smoke in your car, do it in a, you know, in a private place, be responsible. Yeah. Um, but understand um, that even today, if they see you vaping in your car and they decide to pull you over, everything better match. You better have an MMTC card. You better be buying from one of the local uh, you know, uh, dispensaries here in the state of Florida, mm -hmm. and the cartridges better all line up, or... If they don't, they're going to take that product from you. They're going to test it. If it tests positive for THC, um, they rescue for a felony right on the spot. Really? So, again, be smart about what you're doing. Think about how you're ingesting your cannabis. Stay home. Do it the right way. If they see you on the road, you're going to, it's going to create a problem. I think, listen, it's like alcohol. We don't want to be drinking and driving. You shouldn't be smoking and driving. You shouldn't be smoking and shooting your gun. Right. Speaking of that, what isn't is is there a isn't there a law saying that you can't get a medical marijuana card if you also have a concealed carry permit? Basically, I'll tell you what you got right now in the state of Florida, and actually it's a federal requirement. Uh, there's a form that you fill out. It's called a 4473. Mm -hmm. As soon as you buy a firearm, you fill it out. One of the questions on that form is, do you currently use marijuana? If you check yes to that question, they cannot sell you the gun. Really? Again, it's a federal law. Uh, we still have It's still a scheduled one drug. Um, and until they change that, that law is not going to change a whole lot. Now, with that said, Nikki Freed, here's the new agriculture commissioner for the state of Florida, has and is going to uh, allow in the state of Florida for you to carry your CCW, your con carry conceal permit, and have an MMTC card, which means you're going to obviously be armed. Right. So this will, um, I'm sure there'll be some, there'll be some pushback. It's like everything else. It's like, listen, right. you're not, well, you're not supposed to be drinking and shooting your gun. 
Although I can right. go on YouTube and I can see Alcohol is going to encourage you to use your gun. <laughs> <laughs> Weed is not. <laughs> Bingo. Different different forms. And that's so true. Because right. listen, it's going to make you de-escalate a whole lot more than alcohol. Exactly. Would escalate. So looking at uh, looking at the process, looking at what's in place, she's going to push this now. We're working with her. We, ag- we agree with this process. We think that if you carry a gun, um, hey, listen, even if you're a law enforcement official, and I know that this does not sit well with a lot of these guys, but again, they have a suicide problem or challenge that allows with, uh, that is developed within the, in- the uh, in- industry itself. Um, we just had a, a deputy who committed suicide in Pasco here um, with her service revolver. She's, her husband was a deputy. And she shot and killed herself. And listen, under any circumstances, that's not acceptable. Why would a young, uh, she's only been an, a deputy for five years, uh, had a great looking family. I don't know the deputy personally, but I knew the stresses that they go through on an, on an everyday basis. And when I mm-hmm. talked to them about cannabis, um, most of them have such a hardcore line on that on the, with regards to being able to ingest cannabis that they were like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. So I'll, my next question is to them, so suicide's okay as an alternative? Right. So how do we, you know, how do we curb that? How, again, through education, making people understand. Um, if, you go to, if you go to California right now, it's funny because it is legal there. Um, so even when I'm standing with a group of people and one of the guys pulls a joint out, um, let's say at a convention, um, I immediately kind of stoop my shoulders down, like, hey, 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 you know, and I have to catch myself because it's so, hey. we're so trained. Right to do it this way. Um, for the longest time out in California, we hard car got into this originally through uh, a former police officer who saw a need. Mm-hmm. Um, the challenges are obviously this is a, a cash based business. So what happens is when I drop off cannabis, we're picking up cash. Okay. So this is the company hard car that, that you're involved with right now. Correct. How, how did you get involved with these guys? How did you, how did you start working for these guys? Um, initially, uh, I had wanted to get into the industry, obviously from an advocacy standpoint, because of the military guys, the two of mm-hmm. my buddies, and really didn't know how to get into it. But after seeing, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier with Viceland, and mm-hmm. seeing there were security teams that were doing this, kind of to look at that model and see if it was something we could do here in Florida. Right. So the challenge is that everybody wants to do this. Um, the reality of it is that not everybody can do this. If uh, we now vet all of our guys, so as, as you come in, we do federal background checks on everybody. I've had from pedophiles to guys who told me they were Navy SEALs, and obviously, you know, both ends of those that spectrum is not acceptable, especially if you're, right. if you're the pedophile and you're not the Navy SEAL, that's a problem. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> my challenge is we're finding guys that were who they said they were, who had a great temperament, okay. to bring them into this okay. kind of cool and emerging industry. Okay. So we... Uh, so Hard Car's main objective is transporting... Cash, correct? Or is it also transporting marijuana? Uh, it's actually doing both. Okay. Um, our vehicles are up-armored. Um, the new ones we now have actually have uh, AC units in the back. What does that mean, up-armored? Up-armored is uh, basically a bullet resistant. Okay. So the front cab is, the windows are completely resilient to any kind of gunfire that they would you try to use on the, on the vehicle at all. Wow. So that's really to kind of keep the guy safe. Mm-hmm. Again, we, that's our primary objective here at the end of the day. Right. Um, and again, they're discreet. So if you looked at them, it looks like a sprinter van. You would not have any clue that that's what it is. Um, we run with the windows are slightly tinted. Um, all of our operations are typically done behind the building. So we try to stay out of the way of the general public. Most of the guys are tacked out. They carry rifles and handguns and and uh, which always kind of looks weird in front of a dispensary. Oh, that's why right. team's there. So um, we dress a little bit different. We try to act a little different. We're not real aggressive. Um, we do uh, uh, pre-trips to make sure that if we're you know, coming, coming up on a new place, where they're located at, what's the crime rate in that area, um, what are the possibilities of somebody trying to come up and jack us in the middle of, a, of either a cash offload or a cannabis offload. Um, so it's, it's the reoccurring process of staying alert and staying on your game. So who, who are the clients of Hardcar? Um, right now, out, at, out in California, there's about 6,500 licenses that are out there, and each of the dispensaries becomes a customer to Hardcar. So we, we do a couple of different things differently than just a security group. So individual marijuana dispensaries. Correct. Contract Correct. Hardcar. Correct. Okay. And we would, again, transport their cash, their product. Mm-hmm. Um, we can do the new, right now, new push in California is uh, for a product called Flash Frozen. Uh, it's cannabis that is... Um, Loaded into a trailer, um, it's uh, literally cryo freeze down to twenty below, 
And what happens is they take this then and bring it to a large press. We actually put it in our back of our trucks. The trucks uh, have the ability to, are, are refrigerated. Yeah. So it's hold the temperature at about 19 degrees. So we transport this as an example. We did 2,200 pounds, brought it to a facility. They put it under a press and they squeeze it. The unusual thing about this is the plant doesn't realize that it's dead. Unlike other programs where you are, and I know this is not going to make some of the other guys happy, but as far as the way that you process it, uh, if you process it with CO2, if you process it with ethanol, if you process with uh, some sort of nitrogen gas, there seems to be a residual f- taste that's left over. Yeah. And uh, so some people tell me, that, listen, I don't like it because of that reason. With the flash froze, frozen, you're literally just squeezing the sap right out of the plant. So you're dealing with a pure process, Hmm. which is completely different than anything else that you're going to experience. And I think that's truly going to be the future of it. It's a cleaner burn. You're not using butane from a from a lighter. Um, You don't have to worry about paper if that's the way you ingest your your cannabis. Um, It actually comes in an oil. There's no there's no smell. Um, It's very discreet. Do you vape it? It's actually a vape. Okay. It's actually a vape. Um, the problem is that it's very expensive to set this process in place. So obviously, cryo freezing and getting it down to right. It's not cheap. Yeah, forty below is is. is but listen, you're getting a top quality product at the end of the day. So mm-hmm. when you start looking at this, and this, these are the groups that we try to align ourselves with. Uh, Flocana is a distribution model in California right now. They're probably they're like the Amazon right now. They come up with a, a weed. Group, Who a is weed. this again? It's called Flocana. Flocana. Okay. Flocana out of Northern California. Great group, distribution-based. And what we do is we leverage our transportation uh, against distribution. So if you say, hey, Mike, we want you to transfer our cash for us and our cannabis for us, we're like, great. We'll do that for you at no charge if you guys let us handle your distribution. So -hmm. we're a different security group. That's really where we make. So now we're going to save you money on the processing cash. We're hard car security is the first group in the country to actually make a deposit into the Federal Reserve. And we continue to do that today. Really? So, yeah. And again, when you think about it, it's federally legal. Well, how do these guys do that? Well, there's a process to get that money in. Obviously, we drive up armored vehicles that are certified up armored vehicles, which gives us the ability to, first of all, transport cash anywhere. We have a license to do this. So just in case anybody's out there who's making (laughs) their ears pop up when I say this, but we can transport cash anywhere in the state or anywhere in the country. Right. Um, Cannabis, unlike cannabis, that is federal guidelines, you cannot break state lines with cannabis. Mm. Um, so there, there's a whole other side to the federal thing with regards to, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to transport cannabis. I'm like, if you transport cannabis and you're breaking state lines, it's only a matter of time before you get caught. So you guys just do like a long road trip and you'll hit multiple dispensaries when you're, when you're dealing with cash? It depends. Um, we, we have set minimums on cash that we would pick up from your dispensary. If you're not doing a million plus when we stop in, because that's what we're there to pick up, we're probably not going to be doing business with you yet. Okay. So we're looking at that that threshold. So when we go to a particular location. So you guys have to pick up a minimum of a million dollars to be able to, to make it worth your while. Correct. Okay. Correct. And to make it every every worthwhile for everybody. Listen, right. obviously the more the less time, you know, what creates <sighs> crime is opportunity. Mm. So the less times we touch this and carry the larger amounts, the less time we have to worry about somebody coming more aware of what our movements are. Right. So as we um, you know, we if we're picking up big cash, we send a chase vehicle out as well. Okay. Um, those guys are armed. They're behind the vehicle, typically in a suburban type, and it's 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 going to be noticeable to some extent. And we want that. We want people to realize that. Listen, if you're going to try to get foolish here, that you're going to get fucked up. Things are going to go left. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, we don't do the traditional, uh, you know, fat, uh, overweight security guy who is um, uh, not really taking this as a as a as a way of life. The guys that we employ, this is a way of life for them. This is a they're gun guys to begin with. Um, they live a certain lifestyle. They're mm. typically in great physical condition. Um, they care about what they look like. These are the guys that we're interested in. Everybody can shoot a gun. It's how well can you shoot a gun? How well right. you know do you carry take care of yourself? When you look smart um, and you look like you're uh, somebody to be dealt with, that sends a message also that again keeps uh, the bad guys away from you. Right. Wow. That's Have you guys ever ran into anything? Sketchy? Any problems or anything? Um, absolutely. On any trips? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, l- listen. One of the one of the few things that um, obviously many people don't do is when you pull up on a particular location and you just take a few minutes to look around. Yeah. Um, and we've had guys who are actually videotaping us. Um, we have had actually individuals within the dispensary that we were picking up stuff from videotaping us. And I was like, uh, uh, "Hello, what are you doing?" 
And he was yeah. like, oh, dude, I'm going to put this on Instagram. I'm like, yeah, oh, my ass, you're going to put this on Instagram. So, so now we have to implement some new policies and procedures with some of the dispensaries, making them understand, listen, we're not trying to be a hard ass here, but right. we don't want people to understand what our movements are, what our vehicles look like, and you know, what are we transporting today? Um, obviously, if we drop off three or 400 pounds of cannabis up to 2,200 pounds, uh, if you do the math at $2,000 a pound, it adds up pretty quick. Yeah. You would be in the situation of carrying $30 million uh, to a particular location where now you have to count that money. Um, we process it. We actually bag it up for the Federal Reserve. I think it's too, it's amazing when you see how many, uh, uh, how many counterfeit bills are out there. So we have to now, it'll, these units automatically pull those counterfeit bills out and we have to go back to the end user, the customer, and say, hey, listen, it was you know, $300 in bad bills that were here. And by the way, you don't get those back. Those go right back to the Secret Service. So it's, it's crazy when you really think of that in the bigger picture. But you think about how much money you're carrying. Yeah. And where could you possibly get $3 million in one hit off of a truck on the road today? You know, especially when you look at the Brinks trucks, the Dunbar trucks. Yeah. And uh, so, again, we're, we're looking to do that long haul. The state of Florida has determined now there's two, two types of transportation. You've got local delivery and then what they actually call the heavy haul, and which just is the same way that it sounds. It's a heavy transport for processing purposes. Again, 1,000 pounds, whatever that particular number would be. So what is that process like to actually deposit all this cash into the Federal Reserve? So you like leave the dispensary with a few millions of dollars worth of cash. Correct. Because only these dispensaries can only deal with cash. Correct. Um, where do you physically have to go to, or what do you have to actually do to, to deposit this cash? We actually have a place where we bring the money. It's actually processed. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually in a hardened facility. Um, and of course, by the time when they're counting this money, we have guys situated outside around the facility, again, making sure nothing's going to go left. And um, they start the process of counting. We have actually the cash. You've seen the big federal cash counters that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we use to count the money. Okay. Um, obviously, if you're counting three or $4 million, it takes you several hours yeah. to get that done. Then we have to bind that money up, process it into a, a plastic bag, see-through bag that has tamper resistant. So if you open it, it tells you through the tamper resistant tabs on the side, hey, this has been opened up. Mm -hmm. right. um, and then once it's all packaged up and stacked up real nice and neat, you make an appointment. We, we have to be invited by the Federal Reserve to actually deposit this money there. Really? So once they do a background, again, and it has to be fully armored up truck, mm -hmm. um, we have a scheduled appointment. And from our scheduled appointment, we make the run. Now, of course, the first time we did this, uh, we pulled up outside the facility. We had three million dollars. We we're kind of looking at each other. Um, I was with the, with the under the one of the other guys who was a retired cop, and uh, we were kind of looking at each other. And I thought, "What's going on, man?" He's like, "Well, I just want to feel what these last few minutes of freedom feels like. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going to happen when we go to the Federal Reserve." Really? So yeah, we didn't know if they would. Hey, they could confiscate the truck through forfeiture. Um, they could arrest us. They could take all the money. There's a several different things could happen and transpire at this particular time. Wow. But it was uneventful. We pulled in, uh, they came out, grabbed the cash, uh, counted it up. We were there for about 15 minutes and then back on the road. Wow. So it turns into a, uh, a better situation now because obviously we're so used to doing this. We have the process down. Yeah. Uh, we have two facilities here in the state of Florida, two federal reserves here in Florida. We have one in Jacksonville and one in Miami. Okay. And we are in process now of a, of a few licensing that we're getting now. And probably in the next five months, we'll actually be transporting here in Florida. Really? So it could be sooner. could be sooner. But right now, five months for sure. And how long do you think it'll be until marijuana actually becomes recreational in Florida? I think that um, by 2020, it'll be voted in. Um, there's, a, there's a law firm in uh, Tampa right now, Michael Minardi, Minardi Law. Mm -hmm. um, he is a huge advocate. Um, he's been working with the state of Florida for the signatures for this. I actually went over with him one day, and we counted out, I think, 100,000 100, signatures. Um, we go through, you have to, you know, divide them up and look at the actual signatures before right. you can actually submit them to the state. And so that's 20, 2020. Okay. I think though, now DeSantis has said, Governor DeSantis has said he's not a big recreational guy. Uh, that's the new governor in Florida. That's the new governor in Florida. He's been super, super, super receptive on getting this thing rolling. They've got now, a, they've finally hired the new director of cannabis here for the state of Florida. Her name is Holly Bell. Um, she came, moved here from Kentucky. She's working with, um, Nikki Freed, who's the new agriculture commissioner. Mm -hmm. Um, they are working together to, to bring legalization here to Florida. So they're, they're pushing hard on that side. I think when you, at the end of the day, when you really look at the tax benefits that are coming into the state, the fact that, uh, this crime rate will also go down, which is a huge benefit. Yeah. Um, when you look at what's going to happen on the, uh, just on the side of bringing in 
new tourism. I mean, you figure if we're doing, Florida's bringing in right now about 100 million tourists a year. That would probably go to 130, 140, yeah. real easy. And um, I mean, so the economy would just boom for that side of it. I think that uh, from our side of it, from the hard car side of it, which is nice, we can put vets to work, especially combat vets to come back to work. Mm -hmm. um, our business model looks great. Um, and we continue to make that push to bring these guys in and girls. We, we actually looked at some females as well to bring them on, mm -hmm. got great skill sets. Um, and to better help educate everybody with regards to what's going on with cannabis here in the state of Florida. Yeah, there's also uh, that big those big lawyers out in Orlando, uh, the Mo the Morgans. They're all are they? They're pretty big advocates of. They're, well, let me tell you, they're huge. Um, it, it's actually quite interesting. We as we got farther involved in this, um, we've actually had some guys reach out to us, former politicians, the former Speaker of the House John Mills, uh, Jeff Camcott, the former Lieutenant Governor, obviously John Morgan, um, looking at. Uh, when I met with Mr. Morgan, figuring out uh, why he was in this industry was kind of interesting. I said, so do you have a dog in this fight? Right. And uh, Mr. Morgan actually has a brother who was paralyzed, and uh, I want to say 30 years ago, and realized that the meds they were giving him were not really working the way they ha had hoped they would. And he realized at that moment that cannabis, this is, this is his brother, realized that cannabis seemed to be the best medication that he could get from a pain reliever perspective. Hmm. Um, a lot of the medications he was, was taking were uh, interfering with his appetite. Well, obviously, we know cannabis is going to give you that appetite. Yeah. So it, it improved just the quality of life just on, from that aspect of it. Right. And I believe that Mr. Morgan saw that, listen, if my brother goes to prison or jail, he's not coming out a better guy. So this gave him a reason to get involved, and he would actually like to see his daughter be the queen of pot over there in Orlando. The queen of pot. Queen of pot. That's so, a nice ring to it. I, <laughs> yeah. hey, listen, like I say, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been an interesting journey to see the politicians yeah. get involved, to hear the reason why. It's the same story over and over yeah. again, um, even with speaking to, to Mr. Mills, um, that he had a friend of his just here recently committed suicide. He believed that he, if he had been uh, able to medicate with cannabis, that, that would have happened. Was that guy, was that guy uh, a combat vet as well? Absolutely. Okay. Was that in Vietnam? I mean, unless we, we just lost a colonel over here at the VA in St. Petersburg about a month and a half ago where he yeah. actually blew his brains out in the parking lot sitting on his awards after 34 amazing years. Damn. And, yeah, how does that happen? How does a, a full bird <clears throat> colonel that has, you know, this great background, all these accommodations, awards, beautiful wife, you finally retire to settle in to really enjoy the last part of your life, mm -hmm. blow your brains out. <sighs> So those are the things that we continue to push against. Um, I've actually found a group here locally, um, the OptiCore group, um, which basically are taking special operations guys and putting them back to work. So this is the kind of guys we're going to go back through and, and look yeah. to bring these guys into the fold. Um, and obviously from a training perspective, we have all regular training and, again, carry firearms. We carry uh, ARs. Um, we have to be certified with those in the state to carry those, especially in an armored, uh, armored vehicle as well. Right. So... Wow, and you knew um, that really famous sniper Chris Kyle, right? We had uh, we we actually do a thing down here in Florida every year called Snipercraft. Uh, Snipercraft is put on through a company called SRT Supply, and we would bring in about eighty snipers from around the area. Some would come in from out of the state, but most of them were here locally. Yeah, and we always bring in a guest speaker. Um, Chris Kyle at the time happened to be one of our guest speakers that had come in to talk. He was still active. Mm -hmm. um, he was in active military. He was act, uh, still he was still on the teams. Right. And um, came to our, matter of fact, we wanted to have some photos with him, get some, take some photo chances. He was like, hey, guys, I'm still active. We can't do that right now. Oh, really? So, yeah. So he was real, real, a super great guy. Yeah. Um, we work with another group called uh, Black Dagger out of SOCOM, Black, ha uh, Black Dagger Military Hunt Club. And Chris would come out. And basically what this is, this is taking combat vets or vets, period, who have uh, some sort of catastrophic uh, injury and bringing them out to either hunt or to shoot guns um, we've got a former Green Beret, um, Romy. He, uh, he's all over LinkedIn. He had gotten shot through the neck in uh, uh, Iraq. And the guys, that when he got shot, they didn't realize he'd been shot through the neck, yanked him back inside the vehicle. Well, it paralyzed him from the neck down. Oh. Um, now, this guy, as a Green Beret, did more than most of us by 5 a.m. in the morning every day. We were just getting up and starting our day, and some of us were waiting till 8 o'clock to start it. But he decided that uh, he was going to be a Green Beret for his whole life, married a beautiful woman. After he became paralyzed, uh, obviously depression set in. Uh, he's in a full wheelchair that he moves with the head, with his neck and his mouth. And um, 
he decided he wanted to come out one day and come out with us out to the range. And we had a guy that was out there the same day who was kind of in the same situation, who had a wheelchair that he could actually mount a rifle on and shoot from by blowing into a straw. Whoa. And Man. so we looked at getting this for Romy and bringing this on board. So now he's shooting again. Um, we're shooting uh, Tenorite, which is an explosive that blows up when you shoot it. So we, we'll have those out to 15, 100 yards. He's actually shooting them again. Wow. So just like a Green Beret should be. Yeah. And um, so we, we work this other side of it through uh, uh, SOCOM and the guys over there out of McDill. Uh, Dave Winters puts this event on. It's a great event. Um, wow. Working with um, also Gold Star parents, parents who have lost children. I shouldn't call them children. They've lost uh, adult children or, or their kids in combat. And then they okay. come over to McDill. We either bring them out shooting. Yeah. Um, each of the parent wears a picture of their son or their daughter on their sh- on their shirt, and we just make sure we ask about them as we as we go throughout the day with them. Right. Wow, that's amazing. So yeah, it's uh, so far. I mean, the journey has been fantastic. And I've also read about MDMA being a big, uh, tr- you know, a- an effective treatment for PTSD. It's funny you say that. Um, they just now. Uh, there's actually two drugs that just came out. Uh, one, I think, if you ever heard it called on the drug on the streets, was called Special K. Special K, I've heard of it. Yeah, and they're actually allowing now people who are depressed um, to through a nose spray to be able to use this stuff, um, which is kind of interesting. But hmm. on the other side of the coin, with the MDMA, now MDMA is now being used by the VA for combat vets who are suffering big time with PTSD. Legally, really? Legally. Now wow. it's still probably in experimental stages right yeah. now. Um, Obviously, MDMA uh, has the ability to go up and, and squeeze all the uh, endorphins out of your pituitary gland. Not, not pituitary gland, out of your, um, oh, I forgot the gland now, but what it does is, it, and it basically gives you all your happiness right now. Right, yeah, and so the they, happy gland. Yeah, so they, <laughs> so they start to look at this bigger picture with these guys who are suffering from PTSD mm-hmm. and kind of looked at that as an alternative to possibly, uh, listen, if you're not going to commit suicide at the end of the day, that's all I care about. Right. Yeah. Um, I'd like, I don't know enough about MDMA to say, hey, it's it's non-addictive or, you know, what the benefits are. Um, obviously, as a party drug, um, some of the ill effects, you know, guys talk about, well, after I did it, and I would, it, you know, it would take me two or three days to feel happy again, I guess, until right. that, that uh, happy gland gets filled back up again with all the right stuff. Serotonin. The serotonin. And I, so, you know, when, when you get, if you look at that bigger picture, I haven't heard a whole lot more about that. Um, I continue to push here at the VA with cannabis because mm-hmm. again, no one commit suicide on that. You can't eat too much of it or drink too much right. of it and have those problems. That's amazing, man. Does it affect their uh, benefits if they're using cannabis for the vets and stuff? Actually, um, right now, yes. And, and the challenge is this, um, because federally it is illegal and the VA is run by the feds. Right. Um, it makes it, uh, uh, so that the individuals who need it most don't have access to it. Now, with that said, they've actually passed some laws in some of the other states that allow that uh, for the VA to be more involved with it. And I think what they're doing is, uh, as an example, I have a doctor over here at the VA now um, that I have spoken to. We talked about this. Um, She agreed to work on, and they may be doing this with other vets, and I'm just not aware of it, but with this one individual. uh, But he had to be willing to give up cigarettes and had to be willing to stop drinking completely. Mm. She wanted to monitor what happened if he just went to a cannabis-type regimen. And so he's been doing this now for about 120 days. And he's actually, of course, the positive side is he's actually given up cigarettes, which is interesting enough, hmm. um, through this whole process. But um, the doctor now, she's looking at this in a whole new way because she said what she sees happening, um, it's, not, it's not like it's a typical pothead. And I'm like, well, so what do you mean? She goes, well, you know, we, everybody thinks about smoking weed and laying on the couch all day long and right. being a lazy ass. Yeah. Well, yeah, I get that. Playing video games. And listen, does that exist? Sure, we all know that exists. I mean, I, I know guys who yeah. don't smoke weed and do that. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let alone if you smoke weed and do right. that. Right. So, but there's there's such a vast number of guys. Um, I recently had a, 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 I can say a former police officer come up to me, and um, he is now medicating with cannabis. Now he's retired. Um, one of the interesting things that he said to me, and I think it's been about ninety days now that he's actually been experimenting with it, was that he has the ability to kind of contemplate where he is in his life right now. And he said, I realized that I was an asshole. And I kind of chuckled. I said, well, I've known you for 10 years. I've known you all these days. He goes, no, dude, but I'm, I'm that way to my family too. And I realized that I'm not spending the kind of quality time with my kids I should be spending. He goes, why would cannabis make me think that way? I said, I listen, as long as you're having great thoughts, I'm not sure why that happens, but keep having them. <laughs> keep because having them. He needs to spend time with his more with his kids to begin with. And mm-hmm. so this gave him a whole new conduit. His wife is still in law enforcement, so there's kind of been some pushback there. But he has been on uh, 
nine different pain meds over the last 14 years. And so he said his big issue was he would have these swings of uh, depression depending on what meds he was taking. And he said, I, I recognize the depression as a chemical response to the meds I was taking. So I never, he goes, no, I never was like, oh, I'm going to commit suicide today. But he said, I, I would, I'd be depressed. I'd be like, oh, this sucks. I hate, you know, I, mean, I hate my life right now. I hate everything about it, but I understand why I feel this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he goes, that's why I never really killed myself. He said, until I started doing cannabis, he goes, I've walked away from all those other pills. So he I'm, doesn't take anything else. Zippo. Just, just cannabis. Just cannabis. That's 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 awesome. So it's well, it's amazing, man. When you start looking at it, um, when I had initially gone to uh, True Leave, which is a dispensary here in the state of Florida, when I had gone over to Tampa to listen to one of their uh, uh, classes for guys who were suffering from PTSD or from tra traumatic brain injury, and I got over there and we they you know brought everybody out. I initially asked the question, "Hey, can you overdose on cannabis?" And of course, yeah. everybody in the room kind of broke out laughing. I said, listen, I I don't know for sure. But I mean, I, I need to know. And the doctor was there said, it's impossible for you to overdose on cannabis. And I said, why is that? And she said, listen, m most of the chemicals in our body that are pain relieving are kept in the brainstem. She goes, so we, we take that, that, uh, that chemical that's in there and we copy it and we make it synthetically and we can introduce it to your body. The problem is that if you get too much of it, the same thing as your brainstem done, which is regulates your breathing or your heart or your, the way your nerves function, um, so by overdosing on that, you can cut those functions off. Uh, they didn't find out till 1998 that our bodies actually have an endocannabinoid system in there. And there's some doctors now that are looking at it from a perspective of, hey, these endocannabinoid systems actually play uh, a role in cancer. And we believe that when you're endocannabinoid deficient, that cancer has a much greater process of showing up. Um, so I, I started to understand. I said, so tell me more about this endocannabinoid system in our bodies and what it does. And she said, basically, as you ingest cannabis, and she said, we'd like to not for you to smoke it because obviously it's still a carcinogen, but by ingesting it um, has a true benefit to the body by releasing these endocannabinoids and keeping your body really at a higher rate of um, uh, uh, the ability not to get cancer or to have some of these terminal diseases. So she said, there's still, because it's been federally illegal, we haven't been able really to study it. Um, we recognize that within the traumatic brain injury, and when you look at football players and or the guys I were sitting with who'd been blown up, as a matter of fact, the scout sniper I told you that was with us has right. had uh, two different episodes where he was actually blown up. He was wearing a helmet cam for one of them and was suffering from it. So when I asked the doctor, I said, listen, I, I need to know more about how the hell does cannabis work on somebody who has traumatic brain injury? And I said, to keep it simple because... I'm not that guy. <laughs> yeah. So she said, hey, listen, it's like this. She goes, the nerve's long. Uh, it has these things called axioms at the end. And as you have these, these impacts with the brain, these axioms get closer. If the axioms touch, it kills that part of the brain. For some reason, she said, when uh, people smoke cannabis, it makes that nerve longer. So those, those, uh, those axions kind of move away from each other. And so really? that's, and that's exactly what I said. I was like, Really? So I'm gonna. I, so the next thing I had with me that day, science was, man. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> well, and, and listen, I had another one with me where it was a gentleman who was suffering from Parkinson's disease. He was in Kentucky. Um, this was not cannabis related. It was hemp related and CBD. And CBD true CBD hemp oil only has 0 .003 THC. So it's not like there's anything in there that's going to create a euphoric feeling. Mm -hmm. um, this poor guy was suffering from Parkinson's disease so bad that um, he was sh couldn't get his coffee in his mouth. He was shaking so hard as he came up to his mouth. So she brought in some uh, uh, of this oil that was in a kind of like a syringe and squeezed it into his mouth. And within four minutes, he stopped shaking. And I was Man, like, that's crazy. I was like, come on. Yeah. I mean, is this real? So I'm telling the doctor, do you think that's real? I mean, if, how, how could the medical profession not know this? This poor guy is shaking 24 hours, seven days a week for the rest of his life. When you can give him that, which contains no THC, and he right. stops within four minutes of shaking. And she started laughing. She said, listen, let's call the doctor. I know this doctor that's in this video. Let's call her. And he said, now, before I tell you this, before we call them, as a doctor, if I lie to you intentionally, I run the risk of losing my license. So I can, she goes, I can tell you right now, this doctor doesn't want to lose her license. So I, I know there's no deception going on here, but let's, let's find out what's really going on. So she called her up and, you know, we broke into a 10 minute dissertation about what we were looking at. She said, listen, at the end of the day, I said to her, how do you know this guy just doesn't have his own agenda? And this is his way of tricking the system so that, oh, well, we've got to have this, right. you know, legal. And uh, she said, listen, it's, uh, 
I agree with what you're saying. I didn't have something actually hooked up to him that would say, hey, you know, this is what his heart rate's doing. This is what right. his senses are going on. She goes, but I have a nine-year-old girl. And when I give her this, this stuff, it does the same thing to her. And I can assure you the nine-year-old girl doesn't have a, uh, uh, an agenda. So again, so these, these, these benefits of cannabis, or again, in this case, it's hemp, um, are unbelievable. And I think that when you start looking across the board as to what it could do um, to help, again, to the vets, uh, I'm all for it. Uh, that's that's my continued push in this right. whole in this whole process. Yeah, and that's another huge thing is is young kids with cancer, um, you know, being a treatment for that. Bingo! And just just legalized here in Florida. Also, you can now, if your child is suffering from one of those diseases, you can actually legally now. Again, it'll probably be at the end of this month when it actually goes through the Senate and becomes right. law. Um, but you'll actually be able to do that now in Florida, where parents before who lived in other states um, would have to move from that state mm -hmm. to Colorado, let's say to be able to treat their child. Right. So then all of a sudden you figure out these kids are gone from like having 15 or 20 seizures a week to like one a month. <sighs> how can you, again, how can you not right. address that and say, you know, our laws have been unjust. I get why they brought them into, into play, but they've been unjust. And now it's time to change that. I wonder what's going to happen in like the next 10 years, maybe five years to the, uh, like the, big pharma, you know what I mean? Like all the companies manufacturing all those, all those opioids and the fentanyls and, and all those types of businesses. Like you said, the guy we were talking about before, who's, you know, very male similar. Yep. Right. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, what's going to happen to that industry? Do you think, you think marijuana is going to take it down? You think it's going to have a big, put a big dent in it, obviously. No, well, I think here's what's going to happen. And it's already kind of happening. Uh, Alfreya, who is a uh, Marlboro cigarettes out of right. Canada are now trying to get into the cannabis business. Right. I saw that. Yeah. So I'm like, go fucking tell the story about your Marlboro man who died of cancer. Right. Fucking cigarettes because the cigarettes have 700 different chemicals in them. Mm -hmm. If they're going to change the dynamics, you know, one of the processes that we have with cannabis today, which is really interesting, was that it's not the same plant it was 40 years ago. Yeah. So you can't get, I, I saw this for an officer, and if any guys are listening out there with regard to the law enforcement side of it, too much THC is a bad thing because it makes you feel paranoid. So you THC makes you feel paranoid. THC too much THC in cannabis will make you paranoid. Okay. So what, what I see is oh everybody's worried about this THC and we're going to breed these things to be like oh more THC. That's not the idea because who wants to sit around and think oh god am I getting busted here in a second oh shit <laughs> yeah. is somebody looking at me oh man so you're you're not going to when I see officers talk about, oh, it's just me, they're growing in this grow house over here and it's, it's 40 times stronger. That's, that's a false statement. They, they put this again in the wrong light. Um, that's not how this works. Um, when you start looking at, when I talk to some of the geneticists, understanding, I mean, I'm thinking like, these guys are working under a magnifying glass and they're you know pulling out the chromosomes and the seed mm -hmm. and they're genetically putting them together. Um, when the fact is, when I ask the guys, how do you do that, man? He goes, here's what we do. He goes, I take 100 seeds, I plant them, out of the 100 plants, one of them's different. I want to understand why that one's different. And what are the characteristics? So I pull that plant in and start looking at what, what goes on, and all of a sudden I find out that it has uh, a different color or uh, a different CBD or it's um, maybe it is a little stronger. And, you know, We want to use this for a different process. Um, so Because that's how we do this. There's no gene splicing. It's not genetically done. Um, obviously, if you grow it indoors, you get four great grows a year. Uh, it's the perfect weather every day. You can control bugs. You can control, but it's not full spectrum. S the plants that grow outside are full spectrum sun. So you're getting every bit of that uh, full radiation of the sun every single day. So there's people that will say, oh, well, that's because it's grown indoors. Uh, it's not quite as good as the outdoor stuff. And what do you define as good? I mean, it, does good mean higher THC? Uh, not necessarily higher THC, greater looking plant, maybe okay. a bigger plant okay. yields more product. Um, some of the funny attributes about cannabis is as it gets stale and cannabis does get stale, it gets mm -hmm. very, very high in CBD. Yeah. As it gets higher in CBD and it gets more stale, it makes you want to go to sleep. Okay. So there's different ways you can bring this to the market with regards and how you want to show the cannabis itself. It's all pretty much the same. You've got sativa and you've got uh, indigo. Yeah. Um, people talk about hybrids or, or what they're doing. I'm not really sure in the bigger picture how that all works, but when you kind of look at it, it all looks the same. Um, the way they trim the buds up is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. The way they process it is pretty much the same. Everybody tries to come up with a different, uh, a different branding perspective. Uh, as an example, one of the guys that we work with, one of the vets groups, um, wanted to private label 
some cannabis. And so we were looking at trying to figure out a great name um, for this. And so as we're sitting around kind of brainstorming, hey, what would be a good name for this? One of the guys came back in and said, hey, I just got to walk on my dog. And it took me from the time I left the house to walk the dog, I smoked one joint. So we came up with dog walkers. Nice. And so all of a sudden, dude, now it's vet. It's a veteran-owned process. We call them dog walkers. They come in a little, you know, little case. So, oh, the little tin with the little joints in it. Bingo. Okay. You saw them. Yeah. You saw them. Oh so yeah. Those things are awesome. That, and they're called dog walkers. I love those things. And what a simple name. And it has taken off like you can't believe. And it's a, um, it's a, uh, you know, standard sativa. Sativa's kind of up. You know, yeah. you want to be on the, on the high side of it. The indigo kind of helps you go to sleep at night. And uh, so I see that when these guys participate and they take the sativa, um, obviously they're much more happier, much more content. Right. Helps me focus. I, I, it's funny. When you talk to different people about different ways that it affects them, it's mm-hmm. amazing across the board. Yeah. Um, obviously for the vet side of it, most of these guys do it to treat themselves at night before they go to sleep. But I always hear about the, the great sleep that they get. So I always encourage them, get the indica. Yeah. Keep getting mm-hmm. the indica. You know, go that route. Right. Yeah. So and it works out nice. That's amazing. Cool. Is there any other big uh, points that we should hit that we haven't hit yet? Um, I think, first of all, we just need to make sure that everybody's aware that if you haven't filled out your um, your sheets to send into the state to make it legalized recreationally, mm-hmm. go to True Leave, go to Cetera, go to Cure Leaf. Go to the actual dispensaries. Go to the dispensaries. They have the forms there. Fill them out. Okay. Get them turned in. Um, if we just sit back and wait for this to happen, it's, it's not. So we all okay. need to be proactive on that side of the coin. Um, understand that from a hard car perspective, well, we're now going to be here in the state. Mm-hmm. Um, we transport. Uh, we do this through variances that we've actually worked in place with the, the uh, uh, through the statute here in the state of Florida. So if anybody is looking for transportation on cash, uh, looking for transportation on cannabis, there is a way to do that legally here in the state of Florida, which uh, we're one of the first groups to actually do the variance here in the state. So I actually have that in my possession. So... If anybody out there listening wants to uh, have some services, we can talk. How can they contact Hardcar? Uh, you, can, you can reach me off of our website, which is hardcar, all one word, dot com, or you can reach me at mike at hardcarsecurity.com. Perfect. Either or. So it works out great. That's awesome, man. Thank you so much for your knowledge and your time. It's been great, a great podcast. I learned a lot. Yeah.